Poetry started to make more sense to me after I read uh, Jim Longenbach's book, The Art of the Poetic Line. Jim teaches at the University of Rochester, where I went to school, and um, he was my teacher. It seems to me, as I look over the last 50 or 60 years of American poetry... Still is in a lot of ways. That our poetry has existed and most if you ask about him, whether it's at the University of Rochester or Warren Wilson, where he also teaches, you'll hear that he's a kind person, that he's a bit of a joker, and that he's scary smart. And here's one reason why. The first sentence of the Art of the Poetic line, it reads, Poetry is the sound of language organized in lines. How about them apples? definition for poetry without imperative for mysticism, emotion, or intellectualism is the sound of language organized in lines. It seems too simple, right? I mean, there's got to be some sort of hidden message here. It's poetry. There's always a hidden message. But to be honest, this definition is as simple as it sounds. One of the things that differentiates poetry from prose and this is probably the biggest thing, at least in my mind, are the lines. Um, sometimes I feel lost when I'm reading prose because I don't have the line to help me understand where my attention should be. As you know, I'm working on a novel for the first time. I've never done it before. And as I write this novel, the thing that I miss the most about poetry is the line. It just, it lends to language a powerful physicality. It directs your eyes where they're supposed to go. I mean, so does a paragraph, to the margin, of course, but there's a, a, a purposefulness, a specificity about where your eyes go. And it conducts your breath. I mean, it's physical. It, it, it shows you exactly when and where you're supposed to breathe. You disregard the line, you're going to disregard the poem. And it's unfortunate because most of us who learn poetry in school weren't taught anything about line. You know, teachers, they taught us to hunt for message and meaning through content, but not form. Certainly, we learned rhyme scheme. We learned about different kinds of poems. We didn't really understand that the form contributes to the way that we experience the poem. What does the poem say? Where are the metaphors? What's the rhyme scheme? How many syllables? How many stresses? Answer A, B, C, or D. You know, it's, it's no wonder why so many of us didn't get it our freshman year of high school. Or even after that. To receive the full-out poetic experience, you've got to pay attention to the way that the poem is being said not just what is being said. And the line figures into this at its core. Here's the beauty of lines. There are all kinds. There are long lines, there are short lines, there are metered lines, lines with ten syllables, one syllable. There are lines with specific stress patterns and rhyming at the end of them. And the possibilities are endless. One of my favorite poems, pretty much ever, is a poem called To a Poor Old Woman by William Carlos Williams. You know, the red wheelbarrow guy with the chickens in the rain. And just a quick note, most of us read that poem out of context. Our English teachers, they presented it to us as if some cruel joke about how dumb we are, how we're not supposed to get anything when we're, supposed to, when we're in high school or middle school, or whatever it is that we read that poem. You're reading it out of context from a book-length poem. So... Give this guy a break. In fact, give him a chance. Go read Spring and All. Anyway, to get back to, to the point. To a poor old woman. I love this poem. Specifically because of how deliciously the line shapes the way we experience this scene. To a poor old woman. Munching a plum on 
the street a paper bag of them in her hand. They taste good to her. They taste good to her. They taste good to her. You can see it by the way she gives herself to the one half sucked out in her hand, comforted, a solace of ripe plums seeming to fill the air. They taste good to her. Let's take a look at the second stanza. In the stanza, we get the same sentence written three times in a row, without variation. They taste good to her, they taste good to her, they taste good to her. It's the same sentence, over and over again. But we don't experience the sentence the same way three different times. We experience it three different ways. In the first line of the stanza, Williams writes the phrase, they taste good to her. So that the whole phrase is contained within the line. But in that second repetition, the line stops after the word good. We pause on the word good. We savor it, you might even say. And subsequently, savor other parts of the sentence. Like the word taste at the end of the third line. By ending the line at three different spots in the sentence, we savor a variety of its parts. We savor every one of its parts, consuming its entirety in a similar way to the poor old woman consuming her plum. I'll miss the line not just for its power, but for all of the variety of ways that it can act in a single moment. In this poem, the line contains things. It slows the momentum. It puts emphasis on distinct parts of the sentence. It even hides information. And these are just a, f a few of the ways that line shapes the way we read. The next time you read a newspaper headline, or a billboard, or a sign in a shop window, Think about the length of the line. Think about how it is that you interpret that content, how you interpret a phrase or an image just based on where the line divides the sentence. You won't just start seeing lines everywhere. You'll start reading lines everywhere in buildings, paintings, photographs, fashion. We've encoded the language of lines in almost every facet of our culture and our society and in our daily lives. You'll start to see lines in places where before then you saw little else. Now, all you have to do is take a breath and start reading. <laughs>